Today, what will be our learning objectives in this session? Today, we will go through some basic concepts and also we will know how to interpret the Eurodynamic chart and this is becoming a very important question in part one in MRSOG. And we will go through the broad lines, the main lines or the main modalities of treatment of the different types of urinary incontinence. But before we go through the lecture, we have to know that this part is important in the clinical practice, but for the basic science, we will go through very basic concepts. We will not go through very advanced issues because, of course, the advanced issues will be related to part two MRCUG. But for part one, we have to know how to interpret the graph and how to differentiate between different types of the bladder disorders. So we will go through very basic and very superficial items. I will not give you much advanced things because this will be related more to MRCG part two. Sorry, I have a problem I think, in the application. Can you hear my voice? Yes, now I can hear you. I think there is something wrong in the server, so let me fix the problem. it's working so I'm sorry for this problem now first, what are the Eurodynamics or the Eurodynamic observations before they were given the name of Eurodynamic investigations but now they are called Eurodynamic observations because they are just observations made by certain tests Eurodynamic observations are made to objectively assess the function or dysfunction of the lower urinary tract. So there are some observations made to assess the function of the lower urinary tract, of course, mainly the bladder and the urethral sphincter. And these observations include measurements of physiological parameters of bladder filling and voiding. But before we do any urodynamic test in any patient complaining of bladder disorders or voiding problems, we should do the following steps before we go through urodynamics. First, we should take a comprehensive history, including a medication list, because in some cases, maybe from the history, we, include, we conclude that the patient or the complaining female is taking a lot of caffeine or drinks which cause polyuria or frequency. Also, there are some medications which are diuretics and cause frequency of micturition. So maybe the cause can be diagnosed from the history. Of course, we should do urine analysis and this is to exclude any urinary tract infection. And of course, we should do clinical and physical examination to exclude 
any organic lesions, especially pelvic organ prolapse, which may predispose also to urinary incontinence. And of course, we should do complete bladder diary and we make a quality of life questionnaire to see if this complaint is throttling the daily life of the patient. So these are prerequisites we should do before going through any urodynamic test. And this is of very importance because, for example, as we will know later on, if you die stress urinary incontinence from your clinical examination, you should not go through the urodynamics because stress incontinence is a pure clinical diagnosis. So no need to do urodynamics except if there is recurrent stress incontinence or to do it after surgery if there is still a complaint of the patient after doing the surgery for her. So these prerequisites should be done before going through urodynamics. Talking about the bladder diary, of course, it's a very useful non-invasive method to know some information about the fluid intake, the episodes of incontinence and urgency, bad usage of volumes voided, and of course, all patients presenting with lower urinary tract symptoms should complete this diary. And for how long we should do this diary? The International Consultation on Incontinence and also the NICE guidelines recommend a three-day frequency voiding chart to instruct and guide the patient to fill in a certain chart for three consecutive days about, uh, about the data mentioned above, like fluid intake, episodes of incontinence and urgency, the timings of voids avoided, and so on. So, this should be completed for three days, and this is a very important information. Also, physical assessment will include abdominal and pelvic examination to assess prolapse, vaginal wall or pelvic masses, genital atrophy, pelvic muscle quality and contractility, urinary leakage with straining and focused neurological examination. Of course, this physical and clinical examination is very important to diagnose or exclude some organic causes which itself may predispose to urinary problems and urinary incontinence. So don't forget the bladder diary for three days and the physical assessment is of extreme importance. These are basic requirements of the International Continence Society Standard Eurodynamics Protocol in conjunction with the following components. Euroflowmetry with the post voidal residual urine examination or calculation and trans systometry and pressure flow studies. These are the components of Eurodynamics investigations or Eurodynamics testing. So these components all together with the bladder diary and physical examinations are considered the basic requirements of the Eurodynamics protocol. So, Eurodynamic observation are not only including the of Euroflow metry, systemetry, and pressure flow studies only. No, it includes the prerequisites mentioned before, like bladder diary, urine analysis, and physical and clinical examination. And of course, before all of that, we have to take a very comprehensive history, including medication list. Is it clear up till now? Hello? Is it clear up till now? Yes, clear. Okay. Of course, we have to know some important definitions like stress urine incontinence is involuntary urine leakage on effort or exertion or on sneezing or coughing or by another meaning with increase in the intra-abdominal pressure. So stress urinary incontinence is involuntary urine leakage 
associated with any effort or any increase in the intra-abdominal pressure. Urgency urinary incontinence is urine leakage which is accompanied or immediately preceded by urgency. And what's urgency? Urgency is a sudden compelling desire to urinate that is difficult to delay. So in urgency urinary incontinence, the patient suddenly feels that he wants to go to void urine or a very severe sudden desire to urinate and even sometimes it cannot be delayed and it's associated with a stage of urine or leakage of urine before reaching the toilet. So this is urgency urinary incontinence. If the patient is suffering from both symptoms, this is called mixed urinary incontinence. So, stress, urinary incontinence, is involuntary urine leakage on effort or exertion. Urgency is involuntary leakage of urine associated or preceded by a sudden compelling desire to urinate. And the mixed is the combination of both symptoms. Overactive bladder is defined as urgency that occurs with or without urgency urinary incontinence and it's usually associated with frequency and nocturia. This is very important. The overactive bladder usually is involuntary bladder contractions and it's usually associated with frequency of micturition and nocturia and sometimes this involuntary bladder contractions which will lead to urgency Sometimes it may be associated with incontinence or not. So in cases it's associated with incontinence, it will be called overactive bladder wet. But in cases that the complaint is only urgency without incontinence, that will be called overactive bladder dry. So we have two types of overactive bladder. We have the wet type and the dry type. The wet type, it's associated with urinary incontinence, while the dry type is not associated with urinary incontinence. These combinations of symptoms are suggestive of the urodynamic finding of the trouser overactivity. So we have two terms that can be used interchangeably. We have the overactive bladder, and usually this is a clinical diagnosis. While the detrusor overactivity, we can say that it is the urodynamic observation I'm going to see during my test. So these two terms are used interchangeably. This is the urodynamic testing which include many components. The first one is a catheter or a double lumen catheter, which fill the bladder, and another one which measures the pressure inside the bladder, and another catheter which is inserted into the vagina or maybe in the rectum to measure the intra-abdominal pressure. And then the detrusor muscle pressure can be calculated by subtracting the intravasical pressure from <clears throat> the intra-abdominal pressure. Also, there is an electrode, an, an electrode which is connected to the body to record any electric activities. And there is, of course, a, a device which collect the urine and measure the voiding volume and the flow rate. These are the components of the urodynamic testing. So, the components of urodynamic testing, the first one is what's called the uroflowmetry. And simply, this uroflowmetry measures the volume of urine passed per unit time, and it can be assessed in milliliters per second. So, 
we can calculate what's called the flow rate and the maximum flow rate. We calculate the flow rate of the urine. For example, the flow rate is 15 milliliters per second or 20 milliliters per second. This is called the flow rate. And we have also the total volume voided can also be calculated and presented in the graph. After voiding, we calculate what's called the post voiding residual urine, which is amount of the remaining intravesical fluid volume or the remaining intravesical urine. This can be assessed either by doing an ultrasound or with inserting a catheter to calculate the remaining urine inside the bladder after voiding. So the components of the Uroflometry is measuring the maximum flow rate of the urine, the total amount of the volume voided, and what's called the post voiding residual urine, which is the amount of the urine remaining in the bladder after complete voiding. And the normal Q max, which is the maximum flow rate in women, is about 20 to 36 milliliters of urine per second. This is the maximum flow rate of urine. So the first component of urodynamic testing is the uroflowmetry, which includes three important measurements, the maximum flow rate of the urine, the volume voided, the total amount of volume voided, and the post voiding residual urine. The second one is the cystometry, which is a test to assess the bladder storage ability. It involves artificially and continuously filling the bladder with fluid via a single or double human catheter to measure the pressure within the bladder or the intravesical pressure. So I fill the bladder with fluid and measure the rise or the changes in the intravesical pressure through the filling phase. And the normal values of the intravesical pressure are from 5 to 50 centimeter water. These are the normal values of the intravesical pressure. So this is the second one, which is the cystometry, which is a test to assess the bladder's storage ability. And of course, it will give me a prediction about the bladder compliance, which will be explained in the next slides. Then, a rectal placement of another catheter to measure the intra-abdominal pressure, which is also the normal values are from five to 50 centimeter water. And maybe we can put this catheter in the vagina as an alternative if rectal placement is impossible. So if the patient refuses rectal placement, we can put the catheter inside the vagina. So when I calculate the intravesical pressure as mentioned before, and now we measure the intra-abdominal pressure. So during the filling phase of this test, we then we can calculate the detrusor pressure or the pressure of the muscle layer of the bladder by subtracting the intravesical pressure from the intra-abdominal pressure. And the normal values of the detrusor muscle during the filling phase of, of the uh, urodynamic is from five to 15 centimeter water. So again, we have the uroflowmetry which cont contains the maximum flow rate, the volume voided and the post voiding residual urine. And this, of course, these measurements are taken in the voiding phase of the urodynamic testing. And in the filling phase, we make the systometry during filling the bladder by fluid. We calculate the intravesical pressure and then we calculate the intra-abdominal pressure. And then by subtracting these two values, we can get the what's called the detrusor pressure or the changes in the detrusor muscle pressure. And that will give me an idea about the detrusor muscle activity during the filling phase of the urodynamic testing. 
Is it clear up till now? Yes, it's clear. Okay. Now, before we go through the detailed explanation of the graph, first we should know what are the normal euro dynamic values. These are the normal values, approximately, of course, because these are written in uh, uh, different <clears throat> values and different sources, but this is approximately the normal euro dynamic values because if we have other values rather than these, this will be considered abnormal. But of course, <clears throat> in the exam, you are not asking about the values, but you, you will be more asked about the interpretation of the graph or the chart itself. The normal post-voiding residual urine or volume should be less than 50 milliliters. The first sensation of bladder filling or the first sensation by a person that the bladder is full and maybe maturation is needed is at about from 150 to 200 milliliters. And the total voiding volume of the urine will be from 200 to 400 milliliters. And the maximum bladder capacity is 600 milliliters. The flow rate of urine is usually more than 15 milliliters per second. And we have mentioned before that is the maximum flow rate, this is the maximum of uh, urine in women is from 20 to 36 milliliters per second. What about the changes in pressures during the urodynamic testing? This is a very important thing to know that during the filling phase, while I'm filling the bladder with fluid, it should be very small or negligible rise in the trouser pressure on filling. Usually it will be less than 15 centimeter water. So it's supposed that during the filling phase or during the systometry that the detrusor pressure has a very small or negligible rise <clears throat> in its pressure, less than 15 centimeter water. And this because that the bladder is a highly compliant organ. So it can accommodate, accommodate more fluid without increase in the intravasical or detrusor pressure. The maximum voiding detrusor pressure is less than 15, 50, sorry, 50 centimeter water. The maximum voiding detrusor pressure when the detrusor muscle contract during the voiding phase, it should be less than 50 centimeter water. The intraurethral pressure at rest with the sphincter contracted is from 50 to 100 centimeter water and the normal detrusor pressure during voiding is from 22 to 46 centimeter water. This is the normal detrusor pressure during voiding because of course the detrusor muscle contract during voiding and the maximum voiding pressure will be usually less than 50 centimeter water. The intraurethral pressure is from 50 to 100 and during the filling phase there should be very small or negligible rise in the detrusor pressure on filling the bladder and it will be usually less than 15 centimeter water. Now, this is very important to know. During urodynamic testing, we have two phases. As we have mentioned, we have the filling phase. The first one, we fill the bladder with fluid. And throughout the filling phase, we get some important findings, which is the first sensation of bladder filling, you ask the patient if he is now aware that his bladder or her bladder is starting to be filled with fluid. And what's called the first sensation to void that now this patient has a desire to go to micturate, but this desire is not that strong, so he can delay micturation up to the next convenient time or when he reach a toilet. And then the what's called the maximal 
systometric capacity that it is the maximum capacity that the patient will tell you that he cannot delay micturition anymore and he can leak some urine and he will lose that feeling of fear to leak the urine. Okay, so these are some findings that we will monitor or observe during the filling phase. This is throughout filling the, the bladder with fluid. So during the filling phase, while the bladder is filled with fluid, by observing the intravasical, the intraabdominal, and the detrosor muscle pressure. In a person with normal detrosor function, with a normal detrosor muscle, the detrosor pressure remains at zero or rises very slightly while collecting urine even at maximal capacity of the bladder. As we have mentioned, that the bladder is a highly compliant organ that can be distended with fluid without a much increase in the intravasical and the detrosor muscle. So normally, there should be no detrosor activity throughout the filling phase. And this is the key of the interpretation of the urodynamic graph, that there should be no detrosor activity throughout the filling phase of the urodynamic testing. And of course, there should be no increase in the intra-abdominal pressure, except the patient do any exertion or effort. And of course, the same for the intravasical pressure. Another important thing to put in mind that the intravasical pressure, the pressure inside the bladder itself, is a reflection of either the intra-abdominal pressure or the detrosor pressure. Because if there is an increase in the intra-abdominal pressure, of course, this will be reflected at the intravasical pressure. If there is increase in the detrosor activity or the detrosor pressure, of course, this will be reflected by an increase in the intravasical pressure. Of course, if there is increase in both abdominal and the detrosor, of course, they will have a synergistic effect of or on the intravasical pressure. Why I'm saying this point? Because now, during the filling phase, I will ask the patient to cough or do any maneuver which increase the intra-abdominal pressure like Valsalva maneuver, for example. The normal that any increase in the intra-abdominal pressure will be reflected by an increase in the intra-vesical pressure. But note that still the detrosor muscle is still white or quiescent, and there is no activity at all in the detrosor muscle. And that's why the intra-abdominal pressure is equal to the intra-vesical pressure. As we have mentioned before, that the detrosor pressure can be calculated by subtracting these two items. So if the bladder and the abdominal pressures are equal, that means that the detrosor muscle is quiescent or there is no activity or there is no rise in the detrosor muscle and this is the normal and this is what's found in a normal person. So in a person with normal detrosor function, Coughs and other maneuvers are seen at sharp rises and falls with equal transmission to bladder and abdominal channels and there is no rise in the detrosor pressure. So, as mentioned here, that the intravasical pressure, for example, is 85 centimeter water, the intra-abdominal, for example, is 85. So, the net result that the detrosor muscle is zero. If, for example, the abdominal is 85 while the intravasical is 90, for example, this means that there is a five centimeter water coming from the detrosor muscle activity. But still, this is within normal because we know that this is, there is a some negligible or very small rise in the detrosor activity. As I mentioned, no 
uh, worries about the numbers because you are not asked about the numbers in the exam. I'm just trying to explain. But the thing I should notice is if there is any increase in the trouser activity during the filling phase, this is considered abnormal. But the normal person, there is no rise in the detrosor pressure, and I can say that this is the key of the interpretation. Now, when we go through the voiding phase now, this is the voiding phase. We will ask the patient to void the fluid which is filled in the blood. What's happen normally in a normal person? Of course, the detrosor muscle will contract to void the urine, and this will be transmitted to the intravesical pressure. Normally, in voiding, there is no increase in the intra-abdominal pressure, except if the patient do some straining while micturating. So, there may be slight rise in the intra-abdominal pressure if the patient is doing some straining while micturating, but the normal is that during the voiding phase, that the detrusor muscle contract and voiding of urine will start and of course the detrusor muscle activity will be reflected by an increase in the intravesical pressure too. So the normal that detrusor muscle has no activity at all during the filling phase while at the voiding phase the detrusor muscle contract and this will be accompanied by an increase in the intravesical pressure. So this will be the final graph, the final normal urodynamic graph. As we can see, we have two phases. We have the filling phase, we have the voiding phase, and we have many rows. The first one reflect the intravesical pressure, which is denoted as P vesical, and we have P abdominal, the intra-abdominal pressure. We have P detrosor, which is the detrosor activity. We have the total volume of urine voided, and we have the flow rate. As we can see here in the filling phase, there is no detrosor activity. There is nearly no detrosor activity. This is, of course, a very slight rise, and usually this is an artifact, not a true rise. And I'm going to show you a diagram with a rise in the detrusor activity in the filling phase. But here, when the patient is asked to cough, you see that the intra-abdominal pressure is accompanied at the same time by increase in the intravesical pressure at the same points. And then at the voiding phase, here you can see the increase in the detrusor pressure. This is normal, of course, in the voiding phase. And this will be reflected by an increase in the intravesical pressure. And of course, you will see here at the last two rows that the volume of urine and the flow rate of urine appears here. So during the filling phase, there is no urine at all. And this means that there is no incontinence by any means. And of course, in the voiding phase, the urine will appear. Is it obvious up till now? If anyone has any query or question, you can ask. We still have many things to say, but up till now, I want everything to be clear for you. I have a question. Yes, sure. Uh, can you please explain why the abdominal pressure rises when the first sensation of urine appears? Uh, I'm so sorry, your voice, your voice is not clear. Can you please repeat your question? Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you, can you please explain why the abdominal pressure rises when the first sensation of urine is felt? No, no, it's not rising when the first sensation of urine is filled. The patient here is asked to cough. So it's accompanied by increase in the intravesical pressure. But this is 
This line shows when the patient has a first station of bladder filling. Okay? Okay, this is, okay. This is not related to this chart, okay? But here that's colored by red and colored by blue, what I mean, okay? All right, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so now this is a normal urodynamic chart. So that's what I have mentioned before during the filling phase or what we are observing according to what's called the International Continent Society, some definitions, some very important definitions. We have the first sensation of bladder filling in the feeling the patient has feeling about or awareness about the bladder filling. And then comes the first desire to void is the feeling also during the filling systemetry or during the filling phase that would lead the patient to pass urine at the next convenient moment. There is no urgency now. He will wait until the next convenient moment until he can reach a toilet and then he or she will make curate. Then comes what's called the strong desire to void or by another meaning what's called the maximum systometric capacity. Now we are reaching the maximum capacity now and this is defined as a persistent desire to void without the fear of leakage. Now the patient even lost the fear of leakage and he can leak some urine even before reaching the toilet. And of course, the urgency which is defined as a sudden desire to void. So you will ask me, what is the difference between the urgency and the maximum systometric capacity. Can anyone know or imagine what is the difference between them? Urgency, uh, I think, uh, is the feeling uh, with fear of leakage. Like if uh, the patient does not have uh, the facility uh, to micturate soon, the urine will leak. Yes, it's, oh, it's one of the differences between them. And another important one that urgency, it's not necessary to come with maximum systematic capacity. You got this in a normal person, if any one of us reach the maximum systometric capacity, the maximum capacity of the bladder, he will feel that he cannot no longer delay micturition, okay? But urgency, it's not necessary to come with maximum systometric capacity. Urgency can come with any volume of urine or fluid inside the bladder because there is an abnormality here, a pathology in the detrosal muscle, which lead to abnormal or involuntary detrosal muscle activity. So maybe there is only 200 milliliters or 300 milliliters inside the bladder, but there is involuntary detrosal activity which lead to feeling of urgency. That is the difference between both. That maximum systematic capacity will, or the strong desire to void will be the same between patients and normal persons. That of course, when you reach the maximum capacity of the bladder, you can no longer delay micturition. But in urgency, it should, it, it's not necessary to come with the maximum bladder capacity. It can come with any volume according to the uh, activity or the abnormality of the activity of the detrosal muscle. This is the difference between both of them. So this is another normal chart. This is published by uh, RCUG in the talk 2019. This is the start of the filling phase you can see that any rise in the abdominal pressure will be accompanied by an rise in, a rise in the intravasagal pressure, but the detrosal activity is nearly negligible or present during the filling phase. But here you can see the voiding phase. Of course, the chart is not complete. Of course, there should be activity now of the detrosal activity here during the voiding phase. This, this is a normal short. So if you observe any involuntary bladder contractions occurs with filling 
and are observed as a rise in the intravesical pressure without any rise in the intra-abdominal pressure. This phenomena is known as detrosor over activity. So when you notice an increase in the intravesical pressure and increase in the detrosor pressure during the filling phase, this is called detrosor over activity. And this urodynamic finding may be associated by feeling of urgency or even loss of urine. If it's associated with urgency only, as we have mentioned, it's called overactive bladder dry. If it's associated with loss of urine, it will be called overactive bladder wet or urgency incontinence. So the next diagram will confirm this. We can see here that there is a rise in the intra, or sorry, the detrosor pressure during the filling phase. And you can see that there is a mirror image here in the intravesical pressure. And to confirm that it is because of the detrosor activity, you will see here that there is no rise in the intra-abdominal pressure. So we exclude any increase in the intra-abdominal pressure. So certainly it the rise in the intravesical pressure is coming now from the detrosor muscle activity during the filling phase. And you can see that they are mirror image of each other. So during the filling phase, this is detrosor muscle instability or detrosor muscle overactivity. But what kind of overactive bladder here? Can you say? Is it the dry type or the wet type? Is it urgency only or urgency incontinence? Hello? Does anyone know or think about it? No, tell me anything. To confirm or to answer, simply look at the last two rows about the urine, the voiding, and the flow rate. Do you see any rise or see any urine pulse here? It is only urgency. Yes, it's the trouser of activity only. There is no leakage of urine as shown in the last two rows of the chart. There is no increase in the flow rate or the volume of the urine like here okay so so confirm either mm -hmm. it's associated with incontinence or just look at the last two rows regarding the flow rate and the void the volume of urine if there is increase in those two rows that means that this contraction of the detrosor is associated with leakage of urine or incontinence okay is it obvious now? It's clear now, or do you want me to repeat? Yes, clear. Okay. So, this is one of the parameters detected by the urodynamic, the detrosor activity. Another one, it's called the bladder compliance. What is the bladder compliance? Bladder compliance describes the association or the relation between the rise in the bladder volume and the changes in the detrosor muscle. This is calculated or the pressure, I'm sorry. This is calculated from the change in the 
pressure of the tetrosal muscle from an empty bladder up to the maximum systometric capacity. As we have mentioned that it should be very negligible or very small rise in the intravesical and the intra or the tetrosal pressure during the filling phase. As the bladder is a very highly compliant organ and stores increasing volumes of urine at very low pressure. But measuring the compliance or if there is a change in this compliance, this can suggest a presence of a problem. Like for example, some neurological conditions lead to increase in the compliance of the bladder because of decreased sensation and this can lead to in cases, in some cases due to urine retention and in some cases it, like prior radiotherapy, it can lead to damage of the muscle and reduce compliance of the bladder. So for this part, you just know that some findings can be also detected by the filling systometry, which is the bladder compliance. Some neurological conditions need to increase the compliance of the bladder due to decrease in the sensation and some other conditions like prior radiotherapy or damage to the muscle of the bladder or the rosal muscle would lead to reduce compliance and reduce the capacity of the bladder. Now we will come to another important thing, which is to diagnose stress urinary incontinence. Urinary incontinence, or sorry, by another meaning, urinary continence during rest is due to the integrity of the urethral sphincter. So any abnormality in this sphincter can lead to leakage of urine during the episodes or during the periods of the rise of the intra-abdominal pressure. You will find a patient coming to you complaining of leakage of urine during cough, during sneezing, during exercise, during any effort or exertion. This means that there is some sort of stress urinary and contents. This will be diagnosed by asking the patient clinically to do valsalva maneuver or cough, and you will find leakage of urine from the urethra. So during filling systometry, we can make some provocative maneuvers for patients who have incontinence, like coughing or doing valsalva maneuver to assess the urethral competence and diagnose stress urinary incontinence. So the patient would be asked to do valsalva or cough during the filling phase and we will measure the intra-abdominal pressure at this point and see the or observe the leakage of urine. And we will have a very important parameter or a very important definition, which is called the abdominal leak point pressure. The abdominal leak point pressure or the ALPP, which is a measure of the sphincteric strength or the ability of the sphincter to resist the changes in the abdominal pressure. Or by another meaning, we know that the intra-abdominal pressure is reflected as a mirror image onto the intravesical pressure. So ALPP can be defined as the intravesical pressure at which urine leakage occurs due to increase in the intra-abdominal pressure in the absence of any detrosor contraction. This, me this measures of the intrinsic urethral function is applicable to patients with stress incontinence. And of course, there will be an inverse relationship between the ALPP and the sphincteric integrity or the sphincteric function. Because the, the lower this pressure means that the higher the damage or the weaker the damage of the sphincter. And the lower, sorry, the higher the pressure means that the integrity of the sphincter is high. Let's demonstrate this on the following graph. 
When you ask a patient here to cough, there will be a rise in the intra-abdominal pressure. At the same time, there will be a rise in the intra-vasical pressure. If you notice here, leakage of urine. This means that there is stress, urinary incontinence. Okay, and this will be confirmed by the absence of any detrosor activity here. Okay, so this rise in the intra-abdominal pressure will lead to increase in the intravasical pressure and then leakage of urine. By measuring the abdominal pressure, which leads to this leakage of urine, this is called the abdominal leak pressure. So this is the pressure at which incontinence or stress incontinence occurs. So we can also confirm the presence of stress urinary incontinence by asking the patient to cough or to do valsalva maneuver to increase the intra-abdominal pressure. And this is of course will be reflected by an increase in the intravasical pressure. If you notice any leakage of urine at the same point of the increase of the intra-abdominal pressure, this means that there is some sort of urethral weakness or sphincteric weakness, and this means that there's stress urinary incontinence. What about in the same chart, you find here some activity in the detrosor muscle, which is reflected by an increase in the intravasical pressure and also with flow of urine. This will be called Hello? Yes, the draws are over activity, okay, but we have also stress urinary incontinence, so it will be mixed type. I'm saying in the same chart, it stress urinary incontinence, same time you find drosor activity with leakage of urine. This is called mixed urinary incontinence. The patient has both stress incontinence and urgency incontinence. But of course, this will be sophisticated. Never came in the exam before a urodynamic chart with mixed urinary incontinence. But put it in your mind that as long as you can read the chart, you can diagnose any abnormality. So, we have some concepts to put in now. The frozen muscle never works during the filling phase. It only contracts during the voiding phase. Any rise in the intra will be reflected by an increase in the intravasical pressure without increase in the detrosor pressure. This is for a normal person. And of course, we have mentioned the abnormalities which may be present in the chart. Now, this is a sample question. This is a scenario came before, or like this came before in the exam. He give you a patient which completed a bladder diary for 48, for, sorry, for three days, she eight years old, and she gave you the chart of one day, like this, and you calculated your data from this chart that she has frequency 12 times in 24 hours, she has nocturia twice in 24 hours, she has leakage with urgency occurred once in 24 hours, and she has fluid intake average of one and a half liters but made of six cups of coffee and a pint of lager. So, what is your interpretation of this diary? What do you think she has?
Okay, you thought about excessive fluid intake. Okay, do you think that liter and a half in a day is excessive? Yes, I know she is taking too much caffeine in the day, but do you think that anyone who drinks coffee too much will have urgency and nocturia and so? I don't think so, okay? So, of course, this scenario goes more with overactive bladder overactivity. Yes, exactly. Yes, when you take a history from the patient, of course, when you find a history like this, you will start your management by modification of her lifestyle. This is, of course, will be done as your first line of management. But of course, you will think about bladder overactivity because of nocturia twice in 24 hours and leakage with urgency. So there is also urgency in continence. So, yes, maybe the history includes too much caffeine intake, but this will not be enough to make nocturia and urgency in continence. So the right answer, of course, is bladder over activity. When you manage the patient, as we will know later on now, that lifestyle intervention, yes, will be your first line, but this is not enough to exclude bladder over activity. So the right answer is B, bladder over activity. What about this urogram? There is one answer of urge incontinence. Mm. I don't agree with you. Can you think again about it? Yeah. Mixed incontinence. The stress incontinence. Why stress? Tell me your explanation, please. We want to understand it very well, okay? So, to say that there is incontinence means that there is leakage of urine during the filling phase, right? Look at the last row, which show the flow rate of urine. Is there any leakage of urine during the filling phase? By the way, this is a filling and this is a voiding phase. Do you see any no. leakage of urine? No, there is no leakage of urine at all at the filling phase. So there is no incontinence by any means, either stress or urgency. But look at the detrusor muscle. There is some activity of the detrusor muscle at the filling phase. And this can be reflected by an increase in the intravasical pressure. Don't forget to look at the titles of each row. So here there is an arising increase, our rise or increase in the intravasical pressure due to increase in the detrusor activity increase in the intra-abdominal so there means that there is the trouser or muscle over activity but this is not accompanied by incontinence so it's only the trouser muscle over activity so it's not urge incontinence so look at the episodes of increase in the intra-abdominal pressure here at cough or valsalva there is increase in the intramuscular pressure but still there is no leakage of urine. That means that the sphincter is working very well or functioning very well. So there is no stress incontinence. So 
Normally, it not makes it incontinence, and of course, you cannot diagnose urinary tract infection from a urodynamic, so the right answer would be the trousal muscle over activity. So, the right answer is D, the trousal muscle over activity. So, this is how to interpret the chart. I hope it's ob obvious for you all now. Any question about this part before going through the last item, which is the outlines of management? Okay, shall I go through? Hello? Please interact with me. Okay. So, what about the management protocols or the outlines of management? Of course, this part is just, we are going to take some superficial, some highlights only, but of course, the depths of this part is related to the uh, guidelines and part two MRCG, but we will give an idea about the outlines of management quickly. First, in cases of overactive bladder, we will start with some lifestyle interventions like a trial of reduction of the caffeine. And these are, by the way, the NICE guidelines. These are the NICE guidelines. So we will, we will recommend the trial of caffeine reduction and to modify the fluid intake and also to lose weight. Losing weight, modification of fluid intake and reduction of caffeine intake will be some sort of lifestyle interventions in cases of overactive bladder. The first line of treatment will be the bladder training or what's called the bladder drill. The bladder training will be the first line of treatment in cases of overactive bladder or agency or in cases of mixed urinary incontinence but with predominance of urgency. Sometimes patients have two symptoms or the two types but there is a predominance of one symptom over the other. So when the urgency is the troublesome symptom here, we will provide what's called bladder training. Bladder training means that you will ask the patient to try to avoid micturition or to prohibit micturition for certain hours. Even if leakage of urine occurs, there is no problem. You will ask her to avoid going to the toilet even if there is leakage. And then you will start to increase the distance between the times of micturition or the times of voiding. First, you are starting with two hours, then three hours, then four hours, and you will increase the distance or the period between the frequency uh, episodes until uh, reaching uh, suitable periods between the uh, uh, voiding times or the micturition times. This is bladder training and this will be for a minimum of six weeks. If after bladder training there is no satisfactory benefit or satisfactory achievement, you are going to add, to add a medicine or a drug which will be usually an anti-muscarinic drug or beta-3 agonist drug like we are going to mention now. So if the bladder training is not efficient for six weeks, you are going to add a drug to the uh, cases of overactive bladder. In cases of stress urinary incontinence, we are going to start with pelvic floor muscle training for three months. So in cases of stress urinary incontinence, the first line of treatment is pelvic floor muscle training, and this will be for three months and this will include eight contractions performed three times per day. 
the patient will try to contract the pelvic floor muscles eight times, eight contractions, three times daily. The overactive bladder drugs include, the first are the anticholinergic agents. For example, the oxypiotinin, the tolterudin, and sulfenacin. All these are drugs used as overactive bladder drugs, and they all are under the category of the anti-muscarinic drugs. These drugs have an efficiency of reducing overactive bladder in 50 to 70% of cases, but they have many side effects, and the most common side effect, and usually asked in the exam, is the dry mouth. Dry mouth is the most common side effect of these agents. And this is more obvious with the oxyputinin or what's called the immediate release oxyputinin. Because we have many form formulations of oxyputinin. We have immediate release, we have sustained release, we have patches. The immediate release type have many side effects, including the dry mouse, and this is asked frequently in the exam, and this is very important. Note, and also they are contraindicated in cases of glaucoma. So these are two points to note down, and they are very important in the exam. So modified release preparation of oxyputinin has fewer side effects, and also transdermal patch is also available. Also, tolteridine has an efficacy similar to the modified release oxyputinin and fewer side effects. Other contraindications for these agents are myothenia gravis and severe ulcerative colitis, but remember the glaucoma, this is a very important contraindication. So the first agents are the anti-muscarinic. Also, we have the tricyclic antidepressants, and they are not now recommended by the NICE guidelines. They can be useful in cases of nocturia and nocturnal enuresis, but they have many side effects, so they are no longer recommended by the NICE guidelines. So now we can say that we have the bladder training and then adding an anti-muscarinic agent if the bladder training is not satisfactory. Another very excellent alternative to the anti-muscarinics are the beta-3 adrenergic agonist or what's called the merapigron or has a name in the market, Bitmega. This is the uh, uh, marketing name of this drug, Merapigron. And of course, this drug now has a, a good efficacy and it's now replacing anti-muscarinic uh, in these days in the market. But the problem is that the anti-muscarinic is much cheaper than, of course, the Merapigron. So uh, usually, the doctors start with the anti-muscarinic because of their lower acquisition cost. Other drugs like the flavoxate, propanthylene, or imipramine, they are no longer recommended by the NICE guidelines. So put on your mind, we have the bladder training, anti-muscarinic usually oxybutanin or tolteridin, the modified release oxybutanin or tolteridin, or we give the beta-3 adrenergic agonist. These are for the overactive blood. The deloxetin is a drug which can be used in cases of stress urinary incontinence. Now we have finished the overactive blood. For stress urinary incontinence, the first line of treatment, as we have mentioned, is pelvic floor muscle exercise. The second line should be surgery. So it should be surgery, not drug. The deloxetin is a drug which is a serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor, but also it's no longer recommended by the NICE guidelines because it has many side effects and many contraindications, and it's only recommended in cases that pelvic floor muscles are not satisfactory, and in the same time, the patient refuses or is unfit for surgery, and you should counsel the patient about its many side effects. So it's no longer recommended at a first or a second line treatment, except 
in cases refusing or unfit for surgery after very careful counseling about its side effects. So this is a question, 42 year old with frequency, urgency and urge incontinence, no stress incontinence, bladder dairy show, low compliance, bladder ultrasound is normal, no improvement in symptoms with bladder drill, and the bladder drill means bladder training. What is the next plan? If bladder training is not satisfactory, we will. Hello. Antimuscarinic. Yes, exactly. Antimuscarinic. This is very important. We will add an overactive bladder drug, and of course, this will be the drug with the lowest cost, which is the antimuscarinic. So the answer, of course, is A. The answer is A. Another question. You are reviewing a patient in the urogynecology clinic. She has had limited response to conservative measures for her overactive bladder. You discuss starting tolteridine. Which of the following should you warn her are common side effects? Dry mouth. Yes, exactly. In 80% of cases, they will suffer from dry mouth. And this is a very, very important question in the exam. So, we came to the end of the session. We will summarize. Your dynamic observations are made to objectively assess the function of the lower urinary tract. Overactive bladder is defined as urgency that occurs with or without urgency incontinence, usually with frequency and nocturia, while stress incontinence is involuntary urine leakage on effort or exertion. Components of urodynamic testing include uroflowmetry, systometry, and pressure flow studies, but don't forget the prerequisites we do before, like the history taking, the bladder diary, and the clinical examination. The normal detrusor pressure should remain near zero during the entire filling cycle until Voluntary voiding is initiated, and I can say that this is the key of interpretation of the urodynamic chart. That means that the baseline pressure stays constant and very low, and no involuntary detrusor contractions during the filling phase of urodynamics. Involuntary blood contractions during the filling phase are called detrusor over activity. Bladder compliance describes the association between the rise in bladder volume and the change in the detrusor pressure. And the abdominal leakage point pressure is defined as the intravasical pressure at which urine leakage occurs due to increased abdominal pressure in the absence of any detrusor contraction. And if there is leakage during rise in the intra-abdominal pressure during the filling phase, that means that there is stress urinary and contents. These are two publishing. First one in the talk published this year, a guide to indications, components, and interpretation of urodynamic investigations, and the, and the updated NICE guidelines about urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. This is for you if you want to read more about this topic for your own knowledge and for your own practice. Okay, it's up to you, but of course, for the exam, we have to stick to these basic concepts and these basic issues. And by this, we come to the end of our session. Thank you so much for your careful listening. If you have any question, please ask me.
Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope you all enjoyed Thank this session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. You are all most welcome. Don't forget that we have another Thank you. session the next week by Dr. Zay, and we are going to announce for it the coming few days. And of course, contact our page if you need any details about anything. Thank you so much. We will announce, Doctor, we will announce the topic uh, in the next few days. Don't worry, okay? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And good night. Thank you.